Welcome. Well, I know uh, more people are joining us today. Um, and Derek, I, sorry, I think we might be having a little bit of a technical difficulty or it might be my screen view. Um, I'm just going to continue. My name's Emily Mello. Uh, I'm Associate Director of Education at the New Museum. And before we begin, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, think about and acknowledge the site of and history of the land where they join us from, uh, as I know everyone's joining us from many different places. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the new museum sits on the unceded indigenous homeland of the Lenape peoples. We acknowledge the genocide and continued displacement of indigenous peoples during the colonial era and beyond. The island of Manahata in Lenape Hoking has long been a gathering place for indigenous people to trade and maintain kinship ties. Today, these communities continue to contribute to the life of the city and to celebrate their heritage practice traditions and care for the land and waterways as sacred. Also, uh, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the site heritage of the new museum. There's a significant history of, Afri of the site of the new museum. There's a significant history of African Americans on and around the Bowery. Manhattan's first free black settlement was on the Bowery and the second earliest known African American burial ground in New York is adjacent to the new museum site. The new museum extends our respect and gratitude to many African American and immigrant communities who have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of years. Uh, we are also working to create uh, more history uh, to be accessible about the site of the new museum uh, and also thinking about what it means to have living uh, land acknowledgement in terms of our practice and program and the way that we use the site where the institution sits. Uh, now I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all to introduce uh, Tiffany Lenoy Jones, educator in residence for art and social justice at the New Museum. Tiffany is a healer, an activist, a classroom teacher at City S School, and will introduce herself to you all in more detail. Um, but I'm so pleased that uh, Tiffany will be facilitating this workshop on an exhibition of over 37 artists that recently opened at the New Museum. Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we will be following up with resources after the program. And I wanna thank the Teacher Advisory Council of the New Museum for contributing to those resources. And we'll also be listening to you today to see what we might add and respond to what might come up in this workshop. Uh, I'm very glad that Tiffany will be spending a significant time thinking about how do we create the space for having conversations about artwork like the artwork in the exhibition about uh, American history that really thinks about the lived experiences of students. Uh, and without further ado, I would really love for uh, you all to meet her and uh, or to re re revisit Tiffany uh, and to hear um, this wonderful uh, presentation we have in store. Uh, one note I want to say is that you'll notice that we are recording, but we are really just going to focus on the facilitators of the um, the program so that you can all relax and be fully present, not be thinking about being recorded yourselves, uh, but that we'd love to have this um, potentially available as a resource and in our archive. Uh, thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm really excited for your workshop today. Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be in space with you today. I'm Tiffany Lenoy Jones. Um, all pronouns can be utilized to refer to me or to describe me. I'm a public school art teacher at City S School. I'm an abolitionist educator, artist, and healer with over a decade of experience of embedding liberatory visioning and creativity in all of the learning spaces I occupy with youth who are my favorite teachers. Um, as well as professional educators. I am also the first new museum um, educator in residence for art and social justice, a residency co-founded by myself um, alongside Emily Mello. Um, and welcome, it is my joy today to share with you my labor of love 
um, redemption, recognition, and remembrance, fostering braver and safer spaces in and in beyond times of grief and grieving. An effort for us um, and to support all of us and our well being, I'm offering a one minute grounding activity gifted to us from the beautiful chorus. Maybe some of you have heard from them or heard of them before. Um, go at your own pace, it's one minute, um, and you certainly can keep your eyes open and view. Um, this is a listening and breathing activity. I hope that was enjoyable and provided just what you needed following what I can presume to be a very busy day of teaching. So I want to invite everyone to go to the three dots in your little square in this Zoom space and make sure um, that the name displayed along with the pronouns displayed are the ones that you would like us to utilize when referring um, to you to, to today. And then in the chat for us to get connected and know who's in the space, um, I invite you as much as you feel comfortable with, with sharing out what has brought you joy today. And you can go ahead and start sharing in the chat of what has brought you joy today? Eating strawberries, my colleague, sunshine. Moving my body, artists in sunshine. Linen sheets, luxury, as you deserve. It's 72 degrees where you are. Chocolate chip cookies, belly laughs, book clubs, arts and crafts. Beautiful. A belly in my, a baby in my belly. Congrats. Breathing outside, triangles, books and biscuits. Thank you so much, everyone. I invite you to engage and feel the joy permeating from everyone in this virtual space. Thank you so much for showing up in all of you, particularly with your joy today. And you don't have to stop. You can keep going, y'all. Keep letting that joy rainfall happen. Today, we will learn, collaborate, and experience the importance and beauty, I cannot tell you how beautiful of experience it is, of establishing um, a space with a shared group of values and intentions and community agreements. When each of you 
received a confirmation that you would be able to join us today. Um, you received a link to our um, Educated Professional Development Values and Intentions, which was compiled um, by the Education Department at the New Museum. Um, these are my intentions and my commitments to each of you as I facilitate this virtual space with you today. We will have an opportunity to take a deeper dive into these values and intentions later on in our time together. But I find it important that you know, um, and hopefully you had an opportunity to, to refer to them, that you know my intentionality and the values that I am coming into this space with. Um, once um, we give feedback um, on these intentions later on in our time together, um, these values and intentions will become community agreements. And in effort to support the brilliance and accredited um, accredit folks and to show our appreciation, these values and intentions were adapted and inspired by the brilliance of the Aorta Collective Harriet's Apothecary, which I am a member of, and the Sylvia Law Project. These are black and brown, predominantly queer run, dreamed of organizations and collectives. And I'm so grateful for their generosity. Um, I'm sharing these values and intentions and community agreements so that we can move forward with integrity and dignity. And please, if you use these, always, always give credit. It's the way that we actually show gratitude. So today we are joined here by this amazing and timely show. And I'm so honored to be one of the facilitators of one of the many amazing events offered by the New Museum in relationship to grief and grievance, art and mourning in America. So I wanna invite everyone once again in the chat with this question. What is the relationship between grief and grievance? And remember, we're taking risks here. There's no right or wrong answer. There's your answer that we will hold and give honor to. We're taking risk and we're doing some truth telling here today. So what is the relationship for you, the relationship between grief and grievance? Grievance is attention to grief. Thank you, Suheili. Grief is fleeting, grief is, grievance is held. Thank you, Roy. Grievance never leaves, thank you, Angel. Grievance is the space allowed to feel the grief, thank you, Jill. Grief to me is the feeling and grievance is an, oh, I lost Leslie's. <laughs> we grow with grief. So many amazing ones here. Yes, keep this, this flow of understanding and relationship between these terminology because it's so important as we move forward um, in our experience today and the hopes that we can then be in, um, share in this learning in the learning spaces that we occupy and facilitate. Grievance can refer to the cause of grief. Thank you, Sarah. So if you haven't had an opportunity, I highly recommend that you take, you go down to the New Museum Bookstore when you go to see the show and grab this beautiful, insightful book full of text as, as well as images. I'm not being paid. This is not a paid sponsorship. I really do adore this book. It's one that I will have for a very long time. Um, and there are several brilliant writings about grief and grievance. Um, in addition to all that you have said, I want to contribute with my understanding of grief. Grief invites us to be in our full selves, and that is joy. I did not say that. It's from an unknown. I heard it. And as soon as I know, I will place it and I will tell everyone where I got this quote from. And from Judith Butler, which is um, this writing is in this book, she says, grief 
Is the burden of loss a heavy load one carries on the body and so a labor? Grief is the labor of carrying and the weight that is carried, one that is more or less bearable. She goes on to explain that grievance is the turning of the burden of loss into an appeal. The burden comes to assume a voice and appeal for intervention. And if we were to give grievance a voice, it would be the call for justice in a world in which justice seems to be pervasively absent, deferred, or destroyed. Take a moment to sit with that. And thank you so much, Judith Butler, for these insightful words to help us and to ground our understanding. So it makes sense that in title, that this show which bring up this relationship between these two terminologies. And grief and grievance, art and mourning in America is an intergenerational exhibit bringing together 37 artists working in a vast landscape of mediums, but all address the concept of mourning and loss as a direct response to a national emergency of racist violence experienced by Black communities across America. The exhibit further consists, considers the intertwined phenomena of Black grief and a politically orchestrated white grievance as each structures and defines contemporary American social and political life. So while presumably none of us may have our art in this show, we are all present in this show because this is about our collective lived experience in America, both the trauma that we have inherited, experienced, and have the grand power of transforming. The show, um, the new museum invited prolific curator, culture maker, Okwe Nwaze, I'm, I'm messing up my MCS's name, in Wazor, um, to curate this show. And he saw grief and grievance as one of the most important personal projects of his and also one of the most political. And in his view, this exhibit would help illustrate the idea that mourning is a practice that permeates the social, economic, and emotional realities of Black life in America. Um, and that it impacts multiple generations of individuals, families, and communities. And I once again invite you to do more searching and learning about this prolific ancestor who we lost in 2019. So now this leaves us in this place as educators, as some of the most important people in the world of transforming the world into a liberatory space. So knowing what we know about grief and grievance and about what this show is holding and gifting us, moving forward, we must think about, well, what kind of spaces must we have to hold the complexities and the necessary conversations that then hopefully will lead to transformation and different ways of being relationship with each other. So redemption, recognition, remembrance is an opportunity for us to foster braver and safer learning spaces in times and beyond times of grief and grievance. Um, many of us will hear about these times as if um, this is not necessarily something new and when we know the history that we know that this is a legacy that we have been given and that we um, have the power to transform. So this workshop will focus on how we as educators can employ a strategy of social justice movements and organizations to co-create safer and braver learning environments, ones that acknowledge students lived experience while also prioritizing their well-being um, and dignity of marginalized identities while addressing difficult social realities. And I want us to remember that we're also included in this as well. Um, and that art, this art will be explored as a site 
for reckoning with social, historical, political, and emotional truths of white supremacy, as, and as well as a creative expression that honors Black life and grief. So our guiding question today that we will return to is how can educators co-create a safer and braver learning environment one that acknowledges students' lived experiences, prioritizes the well-being, dignity of marginalized identities, while addressing difficult social realities. And our goals today is to challenge popular understandings of safe space. And we will learn the social justice movement strategy of co-creating values and intentions and agreements to foster safer, braver learning environments that reflect the liberation we seek. I'm not gonna invite everyone to get something to write with, anything that you journal with, it can be a digital device, it can be pen and paper, um, because we're gonna do some self-reflection. Okay, I hope everyone's ready. I just went on full view to see everyone's beautiful faces. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Come on with the blonde braids. I see you. That is fire. Come on now. <laughs> and beautiful icon pictures. All right. Hopefully everyone is ready. As we reflect, I want to invite you in not rushing right? Not feeling like you have to rush to the next question. If you find yourself reflecting um, on a question, don't rush. Stay where you are. And, and I want you to find peace and ease in that. Um, and once again, this is a self-reflection. There's no need to share in the chat. Um, this is for yourself because all of this work starts from internal and from us. So the first question is, when have you felt safe? And what has contributed to that feeling? And there are three questions in each question, about three minutes for each. But once again, you'll have time can use a full little over three minutes to stay on one question. I'll let you know when it's time for the next question. Hello, friend. Good, good. Taking a webinar. <laughs>
Once again, a reminder, no need to rush, but I will present the next question, reflection question, and that is, when have you felt unsafe and what has contributed to that feeling? Once again, give you time. Next and final question. How does your racial identity impact your experiences of safety? And while this question encompasses racial identity, I do acknowledge that none of us are living in silos or experiencing our identities as isolated existence. So please, in all cases, think of your fullness, but give particular attention to how racial identity has impacted your experiences of safety.
everyone some time to finish journaling that final thought, amazing thought and reflection. Invite everyone back to the space. And invite everyone to inhale and exhale and take a breath. Unfortunately, we are all not um, well practiced in experiencing vulnerability, even with ourselves. Um, and we experience conflict and discomfort around blending and finding the connection between the personal and the professional in this case, and the personal and this, these stories and this history that is our story in this show. And I'm assuming that everyone that has joined us today is committed. Otherwise, why would you be here? You're committed to dismantling anti-Blackness and confronting racism and its legacy and insidious nature of making it close to impossible to seek liberation now, although it's existing now, the future is happening now. And we know that this work starts with internal reflection. And as educators, it's so important that we see ourselves not as saviors to young folks, but we see that this work is intimately tied to us as well. So it's important that we consistently have internal reckoning and reflection as we move forward. And particularly in this show like Grief and Grievance, when we are experiencing a global time of grievance and grief in a global pandemic. So today we're gonna move forward with having this last question, particularly at the front forefront of our mind and thinking about how race impacts and shapes um, safety and popular notions of safe space and how we conduct and facilitate and govern um, and what kind of behaviors we promote or police um, in our learning environments. So once again, thinking about how we can create safer and braver learning environments. And I wanna take us back to a very key terminology that I'm not sure you noticed, sure you did, because we're all educators, in the description of this show. And that is the terminology, white grievance. Once again, I cannot say it enough. This book here has so many, in addition to the artwork and being able to see close details of the art, um, so many important thinking and writing about this show and the themes that it brings up. And one of that is around white grievance. So Juliet Hooker and White Grievance and the Problem of Political Loss writes this about white grievance. White grievance is the inability to cope with the disruption of white dominance, the loss of ideological notions of whiteness and the power it comes with. Black, indigenous and people of color cannot be expected to mourn in these losses, nor can we be expected to share in the nostalgia for prior years of unquestioned white dominance and hear how it connects to safety. Popular notions of safe space anticipates white grievance, anticipates the loss of being dominant, the loss of being centered. Um, in a reading I often refer to, and we will make sure that you have access to this academic writing around um, safety, which is called Pedagogy of Fear Toward a Fanon Theory of Safety and Race Dialogue by Zeus Leonardo and Ronald K. Porter. Um, this article has supported me throughout my career of reframing and understanding what exactly is safe space and how in many ways the popular notions of it are problem problematic. For one, all too often, 
popular notions of safe space preserves and designates safety of the individuals already in dominant positions of power. And some of the ways that this shows up is that it prioritizes being comfortable. And any pedagogy that tackles racial power or social inequities will always be most uncomfortable for those who benefit from oppressive power, and in this case, racist oppressive power. Safety does not equate to comfort. Discomfort, anger, frustration, and pain are characteristics that are not to be silenced or avoided under, under the banner of safety. These feelings are attributes that can actually propel us exactly where we need to be in the process of creating new ways to be in relationship with each other. It provides an opportunity for those who have been harmed, abused, neglected, um, humiliated by social inequities to name what has happened. And for those who have benefited, even if they're not the ones who enact those harms, to see their impact and then together be inspired and motivated to transform, get rid of, and create new ways of being in relationship. Other popular notions will center conversations about blackness, about race, through an anthropological exploration. So as we move into this show, we must release that lens as an anthropologist who is looking at the trauma of blackness as a subject to be studied. This show reveals our American experience and the story of the American experience in which we all have the power to transform and change the narrative. So what are the characteristics of a safer and braver space? Well, one is risk-taking. Risk-taking is a site of growth. It is not a place of hostility necessarily, but if a place is safe, right, then of course taking risks will be safe to happen in such spaces. Um, and taking risks um, also comes in a form of truth telling. We must tell the truth, right? We must tell the truth. A lot of the distortions of American identity is based upon avoidance of telling the truth because those who believe themselves to be the victors may have to face some hard truths that are hurtful and painful, yet so transformative. Because we have options, y'all. We have options. We don't have to be the way that others have been. And truth-telling and risk-taking can only happen when there is accountability and redemption. When folks can anticipate that if I am harmed or if I create harm, then there will be an accountability process. And those that create harm value redemption, value being redeemed. And all too often in our society, we can see it in our politics right now, that there's a total lack of accountability and a total lack of wanting to be redeemed. And accountability, redemption, truth-telling, and risk-taking are all rooted in care. When we care enough for folks, we want them to tell their story and we want to stand witness to it. And we want to do what we can do to care for them and to affirm their humanity and their life mattering. We wanna do something better because we care. And as the artwork shows us that it's so important that these spaces have recognition and remembrance that you matter and you are so important that we recognize you and we remember you. You are important, you are essential. Grief and grievance and all of the artwork in it as displayed in this Carrie James Marshall piece, that grief and grievance embodies, encourages and requires these safer and braver attributes. They are literal, artifacts of all the attributes of safer and braver spaces. 
And it's important to know that these are the things that I think <laughs> that are part of safer and braver spaces. And I am one person um, who has many experiences, but I'm a singular voice. Um, but these are the attributes that I have observed and social movements that I participate and learn from. So what are values and intentions? How can we bring the attributes of braver and safer spaces into actuality in our learning environments? And one of the strategies that I utilize that you see the new museum education department also utilizes are values and intentions. Values and intentions aim to confront inequities, inequalities, and harms of the world that we exist in. Creating values and intentions is a social justice movement strategy of imagining and creating liberated spaces. We do not have to wait for freedom. Freedom is now for us to hold. So the question is for all of us to think along with the spaces we're in is, what is our, what is your vision of liberation? What values and intentions empowers us to honor and uphold the earth's and our collective dignity and humanity. What are those things? What are those new ways of being in relationship with the earth and each other that we can imagine? And values and intentions gives us that opportunity. So why? Why do we have them? Well, any learning space and community is sacred and it is shared. And it's important for us to value our individual agency while also honoring our community. Community care, which equals you plus me equals we. Trust, mindfulness can be fostered by co-creating a set of agreements that maintain and sustain and uphold a safer and braver learning space. To assert and establish values can be upheld thereby creating the possibility for accountability and redemption. And when we are able to trust that we will be uphold in dignity, we feel safer to share our hopes, ideas, and concerns, to be vulnerable. We're able to move with honesty and, and grounded coordination with each other and ourselves. So once again, this is a social movement strategy that is not new. It's been a way that folks who are, who are being marginalized being oppressed, have been able to um, enact, to dream in real time the world that they want to live in. And once again, in the resource that we will send out, you will all have access to these resources and more. So on the left, you will see the 13 point program and platform of the Young Lords. And this is from 1969. I wanna point out that if you can see it, um, point number 10, we want equality for women. Machismo must be revolutionary, re revolutionary not oppressive. Um, this is an old version of this 13 point program because once again, of dreaming of our liberation, it was changed by um, the Young Lords. And if you don't know the history of the Young Lords, I'm going to invite you to look it up. But in short, Young Lords um, was a youth revolutionary political party that began in Chicago and also had um, a site in New York City um, that was monumental in transforming their communities and seeking the liberation that they so deserved. Um, so this 10 point um, was changed because there was a recognition that machismo in itself is not revolutionary and cannot be. Um, so this is an old version of it. So once again, showing that we have the ability, these are living, breathing documents that can be changed to reflect the growth of the community. And on the right, we'll see a modern 13 point um, set of community agreements so from Bufu, which is a black and Asian um, collective um, called Bufu by us for us. Um, and these are their 13 community agreements. You'll see that it's, it uses language like <laughs> move up, move back, by us, fuck you, <laughs> right? Like this is our stuff. If you are a guest, be a guest, right? So these are examples of what movement work and movement spaces are doing. There are so many folks who are living in the liberation already that we seek, right? It's about 
turning our lens to them and saying, hey, how did you do that? How are you able to have events and hold spaces in which people feel vulnerable, in which people feel safe, right? Um, so this is a strategy that I utilize as a member of Harry's Apothecary and our community agreements. Um, and it, it, it really transforms and informs how we're in relationship with each other. So we're now gonna move into breakout groups. We're going to review the new museum professional development workshop values and intentions. In each group, um, you are going to reflect and discuss based on your reflections that you just did. Um, once again, no need to share out your personal reflections. Um, they are yours, they are sacred. Um, but we invite you to utilize those reflections to think about what are your requirements of safety and then as you review this document, what is missing and or included in these values and intentions that reflects your requirements of safety while fostering a safer, safer and braver space for the collective. And I'm going to go out of presentation mode so I can copy these questions into the chat so ha everyone has access to them as you go into your groups. as well as the link to the values and intentions, just in case you don't have it. Oh, pardon, my computer was cooperating and then it decided not to. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And once again, here are the directives for working in your groups. And our brilliant Derek, I believe, is gonna place everyone into their groups now. Hello. I was in my group. What happened? <laughs> you know, you know how it is with Zoom. It's like when it's time to leave your group, it will just like you. I feel like it's like a vortex you just go into. It is just like <laughs> you. All right. I was on a rant. OK. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. That's the thing, you know, uh, but I'm done. I'm good. I'm totally I, good. I, I hope that um, we will have space in breakout rooms again um i don't know if there will be the same people but there's opportunity more opportunity for connection because i know as a teacher particularly as an art teacher i have enjoyed having fellowship in this time where i feel like i'm in hyper isolation from my community um so welcome back everyone i'm so happy um that there was time built into our time together today in which all of you would have an opportunity to to learn and work together um, and grow together. Um, and it's so beautiful also to see the gratitude expressed for being able to learn um, together. Um, in the essence of time, um, maybe we can have, not maybe, like one person from a group share out what the conversation was like for you. Anything that someone would like to share with the group I'll share. Sure. This is Sandy. Um, because we talked about how the how you know we've some of us have had experience with these kinds of groups before and how we, we also develop um guiding rules for, for the conversation. But then what happens when um there are a couple of people who say they agree by the rules and then they don't just don't do it. So I felt we feel like there's an accountability part missing that uh either the meeting you know, anyone could stop a meeting if they feel rules are being violated and just say, I don't feel safe anymore. Something like that, because we, we've had experience with that, where that happens. Um, and we also had a couple of art teachers who felt um, that there were a lot of words on the sheet and they needed, um, and they were more visual or hands-on learners and felt they needed to see or, or practice what that looked like. I know that that's hard to do in a very limited time, but, um, but it, it felt there was just way, way too much um, theoretical information on the values and intentions for them. Thank you. That is such helpful feedback. And also um, that I know for myself, I definitely want to go back and take a look 
um, at how it's even designed. We know as visual folks, I always say teachers should have like a design class part of their certification of like how something <laughs> is designed can either make it or break it. Um, we can have all the best information in the world. Um, um, and also in encouraging accountability in, in that process and what it actually looks like, even in this space that we hold. So I'm so deeply thankful. And hopefully that this is a process that you also can um, move forward and duplicate in the spaces that you occupy. We're now going to go into utilizing, um, utilizing isn't the right word, but we're now going to go into a process in which we are going to view one of the one of the many amazing works that's in this show, um, utilizing our community, um, our values and intentions as the foundation of how we will engage in this conversation and learning uh, around this artwork um, with the caveat of accountability. Um, in the essence of time, what I will say is um, when I have been in spaces the way that Brian did someone, I saw Sorry, you. I wasn't raising my hand. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you want to say something? Oh, okay. Sorry, I just put my hand up. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> not, okay. Yeah. Um, for accountability that we, it can look like for us today, um, just up, typing pause in the chat, naming what the experience was, um, and I will mind the chat to, to, in case one of those moments happen, um, to be mindful of it and we can stop, right? Like we can stop if we don't get to talking about the entire piece. The most important is that we experience a safe with a, um, the a space in which the possibility for safer, braver relationships are possible. Okay, so we're now gonna move into viewing this piece together. My first question is, what do you immediately notice about this image projected? And you can certainly share in the chat as well as come on mic. Dignity, beautiful, age, the stance. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, I was Matt. just about to say ancestral ties. Ancestral ties, beautiful description. Wendy, the eyes are knowing. Older man has beautiful eyes, that hat, the gazes. Different ages of the people, yet still noble. Family, Marilyn Nance, who I also, I won't say what I call her, but says it's almost as if they are the same, are in the same frame. Renee, the colors and age, the same lean, the time machine. Poetic, marrying one another. Leslie, I'm wondering about them. I'm curious about their story. My next question for you is, as you view this image, what do you feel? How do you feel in your body as you view this image? Proud. Curiosity confronted. Thank you, Jen. Beth, confident, reflective. Marilyn drawn in with Socratic. I'm trying to get all of your names as you speak. Alan Love, Tasha, Legacy, Sunny, Tenderness. Keep it flowing. I'm not going to introduce us to who this image is done by, Dual Bay. It's titled Fred Stewart II and Tyler Collins. It's from the series, The Birmingham Project, created in 2012. Now with this information, how does this information transform your relationship to what you are viewing? What can we infer from the title? 
in the name of the series. Yes, I love this series too. Yes, Suheili, Black image maker, us seeing us. Renee, they know something we may not, or that we don't want to admit we know. Beth, they are from the South, from Birmingham. Jen, the portrait name for a place, the significance of that place. And I'm going to invite folks to engage in what you may know about our history in this, in this country of why is Birmingham, Alabama a significant place? Thank you, Jenny. A relationship to the civil rights movement, yes. Now knowing this information, I want us to connect once again to our bodies and our hearts and consider how do we feel Wendy to Jim Crow, the bombing. Renee, Alabama is a place we don't go. Leslie Birmingham was the last place I visited before the pandemic. I'm so glad I did. Thank you for sharing your vulnerability and connection and these histories and naming these histories, difficult histories, but so real, our legacy. I feel distress. Angela Davis is from there. The Baptist Church bombing. Mourning of mothers who lost children to state violence. Grief, grief. The Birmingham Project is a tribute to the victims of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. Each of Bay's diptychs combines one portrait of a young person the same age as one of the victims and another of an adult 50 years older, the child's age had she or he survived. On September 15th, 1963, four girls were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, and two boys were murdered in racially motivated violence. One killed by a, poli a white police officer and another by a civilian who were inspired by the tragic deaths of the four young black girls dying to take the lives of two more black children. I'm going to invite everyone to breathe. My heart is beating fast. To go back to this image. Tiffany? Yes? Um, I, I took my family to see this. So I think we went on Friday or maybe Saturday. And of the whole space, I, my daughter, this was one, this series, this room where this was, um, this was one of the few pieces that she could speak about and really engage with in terms of looking at the the similarities and the differences between all the portraits. I think there's like maybe six or eight of them in the room. And a lot of the, I think a lot of the work was a little beyond her, but these she really could engage in and talk about what she was feeling in terms of the portrait. And without knowing the history of, of, of why, why Dawood made them, she really could talk about what she saw in this image um, in this series. And it really was you know, one of the more accessible ones for her. Thank you so much, Roy, for sharing that. And it's a pleasure to see you and hear your voice. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I also picked this piece. I felt, I felt like it was very accessible. Um, but before we move on, I would like us to take a moment to give honor to our ancestors, children who were lost, 
victims, loss, to white supremacy and dominance. And I invite you, and it doesn't have to be me, to say their names. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robinson, Cynthia Wesley, Johnny Robinson, and Virgil Ware. I invite all of us once again to breathe. And it can be a rageful breath as well. Once again, anger is an appropriate response. And to take a look at the piece again and to invite all of you to also come on mic to share. Yes, and why don't we know the names? Ask these questions, why don't we know their names? And these are the kind of questions that may come up as a teacher, as you facilitate these conversations and confronting what these works are inviting us to contend with and to accept as truth, to accept as part of our stories, to reckon with, to reconcile with, and to seek redemption. And to never forget and to remember. Tiffany, I think they really speak truth to power. Thank you. And unfortunately, I can't see everyone who's speaking. Uh, they speak truth to power, to resistance, and to resilience. Uh, the young, the young lads' resistance, and the elders' resilience. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Now the intention was for us to go back into breakout groups for us to have more of a um, more of an intimate space to speak about how our community agreements supported us and enabled us and empowered us to share and be in the practice of vulnerability. I don't know how many of you had relationships prior to coming to this workshop, but I admire your bravery and your trust in the safety that we could co-create to share out your thinking and connections to these pieces. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to invite us as a collective to take a dive into some of these questions together um, and to share out either in the chat or verbally, um, how did how did it feel exploring and unpacking and learning about this piece? How did the community agreement support exploring and unpacking and learning about this piece? And lastly, how will you co-create a braver, safer learning environment um, that can explore and unpack and learn and then be motivated to do something? um from this show and anyone can respond you can also ask me questions too <laughs> go ahead i see a hand raised go ahead hey tiffany um and everyone else in the room so this is because I'm having like a visceral response. And the thing about it, this material, the subject matter, is that you really can't control when you have these visceral responses. So it makes me think about a conversation that I was having with some, some of my peeps around um, the Howard Dina Pendel show, around how there isn't, it's like you're supposed to just reckon with the work, but there isn't like, 
an, an exit space if you need to breathe beyond what you've offered. You know what I'm saying? It's like, because, and I just finished taking a course on uh, Sylvia Winters and she you know one of the things that she constantly uplifts is how these isms are embodied for particular people. And so it's just like, I don't feel like there's space right now for me to step away beyond just turning my camera off. You know, like if there's like a separate, like I, I imagine if there was a Zoom where there was like a separate room where Harry's apothecary was always available. <laughs> you know, there was a there was a time, um, I believe it was like the Invisible Woman Conference symposium that happened, I believe at Bard, Columbia, where um, Harry's apothecary was a part of the program. And they had a room situated upstairs where at any given moment during the symposium, you could check out. You can go color some things, you can smell some tea leaves. And when you were ready to re-engage, that's when you did that. So um, I'm thinking that, you know, these development values and intentions are missing the component that values and uplifts the embodiment of the, the, the material that we're working with. Like, where is the escape route that is rooted in healing for me? Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and as I think as a facilitator of this workshop and someone who's in residency at the new museum, I know I have taken that into consideration, deep consideration. And what I invite certainly you to do and um, for all of us to do, um, and this is a learning space for all of us, right? Is like, well, how are we embedding that into the spaces with our young people as we view this show? Particularly if we remove, like, this is not like a anthropology, you know, like moment, like, look, look at this, you know, like this, if we remove that, then it's required us to come from a place of care to, to allow that escape route, right? So how are we responding when we see a student, regardless of their racial identity, but particularly Black students, if they ask to go to the bathroom and want to miss out on this whole lesson, how are you responding? Are you shaming that young person? Are you going to not pass them because they choose not to engage? Like how, how are you responding, particularly if you are not black yourself, right? Like how are you responding to those young people? And thank you so much for adding that idea. And I'm definitely gonna think about um, how moving forward, I know Emily and I would certainly think about like, how can we include healing spaces and in, in, um, spaces for folks to remove themselves? Thank you so much. I appreciate your brilliance. And I see hands raised. I don't know who was first. I don't even think it matters. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a I have a potential suggestion or it's something that I've tried in a Zoom space that has helped um, my students when we are um, dealing with really difficult topics and. Um, it's an embodied practice too. And I so appreciate Tiffany, the way that you have brought some meditation and, and pauses for deep breathing into, into this experience. It was like really needed and you don't even notice that you needed it until after you take the breath. Um, but um, in my classes, we've also been getting up out of our, our chairs and thinking of like an imaginary line and being like, okay, we're ready to step across this line and deal with this topic. And then we're in that space together, that imaginary space together. And then when it's time to disengage and to like return to whatever reality means for you or your next class or whatever is happening next in your world to like take a moment and physically step on the other side of that threshold too. Uh, and, and that has been really helpful. Thank you for sharing that as a resource. And I'm happy that the breath work was rewarding for you. Go ahead. I, there were other hands raised and folks can go ahead and- I, I want to- just, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, looking at um, that little conundrum that we have with that, I'm thinking about how we actually go about teaching in terms of um, at the Park Avenue Armory. We have the luxury of having the artist um, actually come in and speak with us before shows go on. 
And during that time, the teaching artists, we basically like give them questions or ask questions or statements and things. And we spend a lot of time with them as well as the uh, people producing the shows. And we get really, really interesting um, antidotes and things from the artists. We quote them. We have film of them talking about it while they're walking casually through making this thing happen. And before the kids come to the show, we show them some of this stuff. We talk about it. We actually have the artists like speak directly to them. And that little thing of having like a Nick Cave talk to a group of Bronx students and he looks like them. That's, that's something that makes them more interested in like, what is it we're gonna go see at this place? So that when they enter into that venue, whatever is going on there, they have a relevancy that's like attached to them with it. And some might bow out or whatever, but they really, really do come in with a lot of um, great things. And it makes them want to communicate more, which is something that I, I really love. So that's a part of our, the, our thing to do with the uh, students that we work with. Thank you so much, Larry, for sharing. And it's, it's popping in the chat as well. Um, and much gratitude expressed for Tasha for sharing and being vulnerable and sharing that. Thank you for that labor. Um, I appreciate it that you offered that. Um, Tanya says, my black students sometimes want to educate their peers on works that include their cultural references and sometimes want the white students to educate themselves. I try to respect their perspective. Um, yeah, I, I know there is a there is a need. And it's also like how, once again, this goes back to like how we internalize this <laughs> and like what is the actual ways that we're learning and moving with integrity for ourselves and how we can be disruptors, right? Like, um, and to make sure that when, you know, the values and intentions that we, we gave um, wasn't necessarily um, like, oh, this is what you should use. Like, this is a li living, breathing document. It's, it's consistently changing um, and it's a reflection of, of our intentions and values, which once again are living, breathing and changing as we grow. Um, but as much as possible, like to be an, as educators, to be a disruptor, right? To think about like, what is the labor that we're assuming um, folks are going to do? And then also like disrupting that and being like, <laughs> Inviting students sometimes like you don't have to like share all parts of you, right? Like this is not a spectacle. This is not something. And that's once again of like the, the notions of safe, the popular notions is that we get some folks dissociate by making something and that something often are like people or blackness, like the subject that we get to like dissociate with. So as much as possible. Um, check ourselves in that and making sure that we're not facilitating space like that and checking our students that they're not engaging in that way. Um, so it is 6.02 y'all, we are a full two minutes over. Um, I love to keep in touch with all of you. Um, we will have hopefully some more um, <laughs> workshops coming up. My name is Tiffany Lenoy Jones. If you Google me, you can find me. Um, and I love learning with all of you. And thank you so much for your vulnerability. Emily, do you have any closing? Yes, um, I just wanna thank you, Tiffany, so much for creating a space only you could, <laughs> but also only everybody who came to participate could too. I was so oh. moved, moved by the comments in the chat and um, sharing with the group. Um, I do want to mention that there are a lot of resources on the websites and they're going to be growing. So um, I'll just put one here in the chat, but again, we're going to send you links to all of these. There's a series called Kids Menu we've been sending to families to have intergenerational conversations and activities with work at, um, with uh, materials at home based on exhibitions past and present. We have a few up there for uh, grief and grievance, and we're going to be adding more in the um coming months. Uh, so you might want to check that out. And please do give us feedback too. Um, I've 
I love so much the feedback, uh, even though we didn't have a lot of time for it, with, for the values and intentions that I was hearing. Um, and uh, we also have lots of talks, posted artist talks, um, with uh, the curators and artists in the exhibitions that have passed and that are coming up. Uh, and then uh, finally, there are also, um, there's a lot of those programs and then also all the labels for the artwork. So these brief texts that tell you about the artist, um, some brief background uh, can be found at uh, newmuseum.tv. Uh, and that's where you will, this is where we're gonna be growing more and more re resources. That's not actually a link, but <laughs> um, I, I tried to put it in the chat. Uh, Let's see. It looks like that. Sorry if I'm I'm not putting the the, the link in there directly. Um, but uh, but yeah, on our on our homepage, you'll find resources and on New Museum TV, um, kids menu, and we'll also have some other uh, resources specifically for educators thinking about space making, um, thinking about history and what uh, uh, related to the show and and other resources that might be useful to you. Thank you.